with the theme of this T4G being last words, I thought it would be fitting to look at some of the last words that the Apostle Paul shared with his protege, Timothy, before his death. My prayer is that we would all be encouraged to look to Christ, and through beholding him, we will be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So if you have your Bible, I want to encourage you to open up to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I'll be reading just one verse, verse 8. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. I'm going to read the passage twice. After the second time, I will say this is God's word. And if you agree, I want to encourage you to respond, thanks be to God. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. Again, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And so, Father, we pray in this time that the Spirit of God would use the word of God to reveal the Son of God for the glory of your beautiful name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. I wanna say at the outset that if I say something that you agree with and you verbally respond by saying amen, I will not be offended. In fact, I might be encouraged. Just wanna throw that out there. All right, let's go, amen. One of the first questions that jumps off the page for me about this text is, why? Of all the things that Paul could tell Timothy, why would he tell him, remember Jesus Christ? From the context of the letters, we learn a lot about Timothy. We know that Timothy was young, 1 Timothy 4.12. We know that he was acquainted with the scriptures from childhood, 2 Timothy 3.15. We know that he was discipled by the Apostle Paul, 1 Timothy 1.2. We know that he was gifted, 1 Timothy 4.13. We know that he was godly, 1 Timothy 6.11. We know that he was a preacher, 2 Timothy 4.2. We know that he was an evangelist, 2 Timothy 4.5. We learn from Acts 16 and other places that Timothy was a missionary who traveled with the Apostle Paul on his missionary journeys. And we know from Hebrews 13 that at some point, Timothy was imprisoned, presumably for his witness for Christ. And so when we put it all together, it begs the question, why would someone who knew the Bible from childhood, who was personally discipled by the Apostle Paul, who was godly, who was gifted, who was a preacher, who was an evangelist, who was a missionary, who even suffered for Christ in jail, why would that person need to be told, remember Jesus Christ? The answer is the reality of suffering. The reality of suffering. And that's clear from the context. The letters to Timothy are steeped in suffering. Just think about the person who's writing the letter to Timothy. The Apostle Paul, he was literally suffering in a Roman prison when he wrote the letter. 2 Timothy 1.8, therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. 2 Timothy 1.11, Paul says he was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. Chapter 2, verse 3, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. 
And then in the very next verse after our text, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. So why does the reality of suffering necessitate the exhortation to remember Jesus Christ? Well, that's because suffering has a way of intensifying our natural tendency to forget God. When we suffer, it's so easy for us to take our eyes off of God and fix them onto whatever or whoever is causing our suffering. It's easy for our first thought to be about the slander that we're receiving, the difficulty in our marriage, the ways we're misunderstood by the congregation, the sickness that's killing our loved one, the depression that doesn't seem to go away, the chronic illness that we're experiencing. Like Peter, in the midst of the raging storm, we're tempted to take our eyes off of Jesus only to find ourselves drowning in the waves of despair and self-pity, or maybe self-righteousness, depending on how we're wired. Because of the reality of suffering, Timothy needed to be exhorted, and we need to be exhorted, to remember Jesus Christ. And when he says, remember Jesus Christ, He's not telling Timothy to remember a philosophy. He's not telling him to remember a worldview. He's not even telling him to remember primarily a doctrine or a theological truth. No, he's telling him to remember a person. Of course, doctrine and theology help us understand more about this person, but one thing that we need to be careful of, especially in our highly educated reformed circles, is assuming that love for doctrine and theology is the same thing as love for the person of Jesus Christ. They're not the same thing. I just had a conversation with a brother on a ride from the airport here who told me that he was reformed before he was a Christian. That is, he understood the doctrines associated with Reformed theology, and yet he had not even been converted yet. Love for doctrine is not the same as love for Jesus. It's possible to have all the right theologians on your bookshelf, to listen to all the right podcasts, to know all the right theological terminology, and yet not know God. That's not to say that doctrine is not important, it's critical. Please don't hear me saying, oh, forget about doctrine, just give me Jesus. Because if you say that to me, my next question is going to be, well, who's Jesus? And as soon as you begin to answer that question, your answer will either be sound doctrine or false doctrine. My point is that doctrinal knowledge, as important as it is, is not a substitute for loving the person of Jesus Christ. And you can really see it illustrated if you consider Paul's emphasis in this letter and what followed years later. One of Paul's main concerns in his letters to Timothy was sound doctrine or sound teaching as contrasted with false doctrine or false teaching. Timothy was a minister to the church in Ephesus. And we know this because in 1 Timothy 1.3, Paul tells Timothy to remain at, em at Ephesus. And why does he tell him that? so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. So the primary issue in 1 Timothy is false teaching. In 1 Timothy 1.20, he mentions two false teachers by name, Hymenaeus and Alexander, saying that they've shipwrecked their faith. Paul addresses false teaching again in numerous places in 1 Timothy, including chapter 6, verse 3. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. So clearly, Paul was concerned about false teaching, and he wanted Timothy to be concerned about false teaching, and he wanted Timothy to warn the church at Ephesus about false teaching and to build them up in such a way that they would have enough discernment to recognize false teaching and reject it. 
And it seems that Timothy was successful because a number of years later, the risen Lord Jesus addresses the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2, verse 2. I want to encourage you to turn there quickly. Revelation 2, verse 2. And notice how the Lord Jesus commends the church at Ephesus. He says in verse 2, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Did you notice how much the Ephesian church got right? And when you look at Jesus' commendations, you'll notice that these are many of the very things that Paul had exhorted Timothy about years before. They worked hard. They suffered patiently. They loved holiness. They hated false teaching. They stood firm for the name of Christ. They persevered. Those are all good things. And yet, with all they got right, the risen Christ was able to say to them in Revelation 2-4, you abandoned your first love. Years later, The sheep gave in to the very temptation that Paul was warning the shepherd about. They forgot to remember. In all their right zeal against false teaching, they neglected to adore the ultimate teacher, the rabbi, the Lord Jesus Christ. In all their right love for holiness, they grew cold toward the Holy One of God. In all their standing firm for the name of Christ, they had abandoned love for the person of Christ. So Paul tells Timothy, remember Jesus Christ. This is one of the dangers of being known more for what you're against than the one that you're supposed to be for. If a person can scroll through your social media feed and easily detect what you're against, but have to strain to see the evidence of your love for the person of Christ, that's a problem. It's also one of the dangers of being a professional Christian, where you've been paid to do Christian things for so long that you can no longer discern the difference between the pursuit of God and the pursuit of a paycheck. Jesus told the church at Ephesus, remember therefore from where you have fallen, Repent and do the works you did at first. Some of us need to go back and reflect on what it was like before we had the big library, before we had the MDiv, before we had the staff and the assistants in the big church, before we had all the doctrinal knowledge. Can you remember? Can you remember? When you first encountered Jesus, when you first realized that God is holy and that you're a sinner and that God in his mercy sent Jesus to die on the cross for your sins and that he rose from the grave, that you might have eternal life? Do you remember the the simplicity of realizing Jesus loves me, this I know? For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Remember Jesus Christ? I'll talk more at the end about what that means, but I want us to notice two things that he mentions are particularly designed to provide encouragement in the midst of suffering. First, he says, risen from the dead. It's interesting that Paul emphasizes the resurrection here. You might think that the first thing that Paul would say would be, remember Jesus Christ, crucified outside Jerusalem, and then go to the resurrection, but that's not what he does. Why? Well, it's connected to what Paul says about the gospel in verse 9, for which I am suffering bound with chains as a criminal. Paul wasn't suffering because he preached the crucifixion. Everybody knew that Jesus was crucified. Paul was suffering because he preached a resurrected Christ. When Paul was on trial in the book of Acts, he made it clear numerous times, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. 
And so the resurrection was simultaneously the reason for Paul's suffering and Paul's hope in the midst of his suffering. Because Paul knew that whatever happened to him, he was united to Christ in his death and resurrection. As the Lord Jesus told his disciples in John 14, 19, because I live, you also will live. As the Lord told Martha at Lazarus' tomb, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Timothy needed to know this, and we need to know it. Suffering is inevitable. It's inevitable in a fallen world, and it's especially inevitable for ministers of the gospel in a fallen world. All pain and suffering in this life is a grim reminder of a tragic fall in the past and a certain death in the future. But there's hope. (laughs) Brothers and sisters, there is hope, and that hope is found in the Lord who conquered the grave. No matter what kind of suffering you're going through, if you're trusted in Jesus, he's going to raise you up on the last day. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. And so remembering that Jesus rose from the grave is meant as encouragement to the suffering. The same can be said for the next phrase, the offspring of David. How is that an encouragement in the midst of suffering? Well, first and foremost, it means that God keeps his promises. 2 Timothy or 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 12, God made a promise to David. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus is the fulfillment of that prophecy. It's why in the very first verse in the Gospel of Matthew, he refers to his writing, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. We need to remind our Orthodox Jewish friends about this. There's no need to wait for the coming of the Messiah. He's already come, and his name is Jesus Christ. God keeps his promises. Just consider the patience of God in causing Jesus to be a descendant of David. Over the course of many centuries, the rising and falling of nations through war and exile and return from exile, God was at work. And then, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. God keeps his promises. And if he can keep them on a grand scale in redemptive history, he can certainly keep his promises to you in your life. His promise to love you to the end, his promise to sustain you, to keep you, to sanctify you, to comfort you, to provide for you. Whatever God has promised in Christ, it is yes and it is what? Amen. Amen. I knew I could get y'all to say it. Finally, as we close, let's consider what it means to remember Jesus Christ. The idea of remembering is a continual theme in Scripture. It's what the Passover was about. It's what the Lord's Supper is about. In his commentary on the book of Exodus, Dr. Phil Riken quotes a Presbyterian church historian named Claire Davis as saying this, quote, the Christian life is a combination of amnesia and deja vu. He says, I know I've forgotten this before. In other words, as we follow Christ, we keep needing to learn the same lessons over and over because we keep forgetting them. And each time it happens, we suddenly remember that we have had to relearn these very same lessons before. Can anybody relate to that? And so what what does Paul want Timothy to remember? Well, it's Jesus Christ, and when he says remember, it's not passive. So he's not simply saying, don't forget. It's active. He's telling Timothy to be proactive 
active in engaging his mind. He just told him in verse 7, think over what I say. Paul is telling Timothy to fix his mind on, on Jesus. And in our remaining time, brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you to do just that. Remember Jesus Christ. First, remember his glorious person. Remember his glorious person, that Jesus is the eternal Son of God, God over all, blessed forever, amen. That, remember that he is the Word that, who was in the beginning with God and who was God. Remember that Jesus is equal in essence with the Father. Remember that all that can be said about the Father's divine nature can properly be said about the Son as well. As the old school catechism puts it, God is infinite in being and perfection unchangeable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, most wise, most holy, most free, most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will for his own glory, most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. Yeah, yeah. These things are all true about God the Father, and they're also true about God the Son. Remember his glorious person. Remember his preexistence, that Jesus did not begin to exist in the virgin's womb, but that from everlasting to everlasting, he is God. As Jesus prayed in John 17, 5, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Remember his preexistence, y'all. Remember his perfect life, that Jesus fulfilled God's law perfectly, internally and externally. Every thought that Jesus had was a sinless thought. Every word that he spoke was a sinless word, and every deed he performed was a sinless deed. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Remember his perfect life. Remember his sacrificial death. Remember that on the cross, Jesus suffered the full weight of the fury and wrath of God against sin. Remember that he laid down his life as a substitute in the place of all who would trust in him, including you, if you trust in him even now. Remember that he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Remember that God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Remember that the good shepherd laid down his life for the sheep. Remember his sacrificial death. Remember his glorious resurrection, that Jesus did not stay in the tomb, but on the third day he rose from the grave. Jesus is alive. Remember that Jesus conquered Satan and sin and death. Remember that not only was Jesus delivered up for our trespasses, but he was also raised for our justification. Remember that Jesus abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Remember his glorious resurrection. When you're tempted to sin, remember Jesus Christ, that he himself suffered when he was tempted, so he's able to help those who are being tempted. When you've fallen into sin, remember Jesus Christ, that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and that he's the propitiation for our sins. When you're discouraged, remember Jesus Christ, who said, in the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. When you're sick, remember Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly body so that they will be like his glorious body. When you're healthy, remember Jesus Christ and give him thanks, like the leper who was healed and returned to express his gratitude to Jesus. When you're anxious about finances, remember Jesus Christ who said, consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap, they have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God forgives them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? You considering doing something difficult for the Lord or going out for the sake of his name? Remember Jesus Christ who said, I'm with you even to the end of the age. Children, if there's any children in the building, remember Jesus Christ, kids. God made you, and he made you for your glory, for his glory, that you might live and honor Jesus Christ all your days. If you're single, remember Jesus Christ. Your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. Fathers, remember Jesus Christ. As you, in your homes, as you lead your family, pray that your home would be a sanctuary where God is acknowledged in worship. 
mothers, moms, remember Jesus Christ, both his power to save your children as well as his acceptance of you when you feel overwhelmed or when you feel like a failure. Older saints, remember Jesus Christ who says in Isaiah 46, 4, even to your old age, I am he, and to, oh, to gray hairs, I will carry you. I have made and I will bear, I will carry and I will save. Deacons, as you serve the Lord, remember Jesus Christ, the ultimate deacon who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Pastors, as you lead your congregations, remember Jesus Christ, the good shepherd and overseer of our souls. Remember that your righteousness is not found in your leadership, your sermons, or your counseling. Your righteousness is found in Jesus. That's what we're talking about, y'all. We're talking about Jesus, the God glorifier, the universe creator, the prophecy fulfiller, the perfect law obeyer, the scripture validator, the father honorer, the humility modeler, the cross carrier, the sin bearer, the death conqueror, the grave defeater, the salvation achiever, the prayer answerer, the proud humbler, the weak strengthener, the elect preserver, the triumphant returner, the justice executor, the Satan destroyer, the eternal joy giver. That's Jesus, y'all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, there's, there's none like you in heaven or on earth, and we praise your holy name. We pray that you would bless your word to our hearts and our minds for the glory of your great name, we ask in Jesus' name, amen.